Hey, everybody. Welcome to Connect. So good to have you here. It's so great to see this crowd of customers, of partners, people from all over the world joining us today and this week to help really drive our organizations forward. I'm so excited that you're here. And I know that you're here for this key topic. You're here to talk about asteroid induced evolution. Okay, now, I'm si nobody, I don't see anybody checking their badges to see if they're at the right conference or not. Uh, but this, I'm, I promise you, in the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna bring us back to why this is about asteroid induced evolution. So stay with me for just a few minutes, if you will. Okay, so why are we talking about asteroid induced evolution? Well, it started with the dinosaurs. They roamed the Earth for 180 million years. They evolved, they grew, they changed. Top of the food chain, everything was going great for them for 180 million years, right? And then they looked up in the sky one day, and there's this big, bright, shiny object. It's like, hey, that's pretty cool. Look at that, it's beautiful. But it wasn't. It was not a good day for the dinosaurs. And when that asteroid hit, in very short time frame, it wiped them out. They, didn't, they weren't able to evolve with the change that happened, the climate change and everything else that ensued from that asteroid impact. So, now how is that relevant to this room? The reason it's relevant for all of us is we've had that same asteroid impact and I don't think for a lot of folks, it's even clear that that happened. 20 years ago when the internet hit, it changed everything. It changed the world in which we lived in dramatically. And the speed at which everything needed to operate to succeed in that world changed at the same time. Our need to evolve rapidly with that impact of the internet and digitization and everything that followed from it has been tremendous and everything changed. So what changed? So let's start with the first thing that changed, our customer. Our customer, whether that customer is, you know, this young woman, she's a completely different animal than she was 20 years ago. How she consumes information, what she expects out of her vendors, what she expects out of her university, out of her doctors as an employee, she is a different animal. She's evolved rapidly, and serving her is completely different than it was serving her 20 years ago. So our customers, internal customers, external customers, have rapidly changed. That's the first thing that we're dealing with. The second thing that we're dealing with is the technology that we're applying has also changed dramatically, faster than ever. The arsenal of capabilities that we have in front of us today, cloud, SaaS, uh, every type of technology that continues to come, uh, that is containerization, everything else that we're using that drives our businesses forward is evolving faster than it ever has. So what do we do about that? How do we react to that kind of change? How do we respond to it? Well, we do the reasonable thing within our organizations. We start working on projects to respond. So we do big data projects and SaaS, SaaS deployments and all kinds of storage initiatives and everything, security initiatives, everything we can do to respond to those rapid changes that are happening. And what happens as a result of all that is we end up with this list of thou hundreds, thousands of projects. So the IT organizations and a lot of these big companies have lists, they call it burn down. They're burning down their IT project lists. And when there's 500 lists on your, on your project list, you burn those down, guess what? There's 500 more right behind that ready to go and you're just running on that hamster wheel. All day long, you're running on that wheel, trying to go faster, trying to adapt. And that's not really a recipe for success. We can't just keep running faster. So we're dealing with completely changed customers, completely changed technology infrastructure, and then there's this other really annoying thing that we have to deal with and that's all those new entrants into the market. People that look like this that are out to eat your lunch. Okay, 
These folks are a startup somewhere, and they used to target, they'd target a technology, now they're targeting banks. This is a great, I love this slide. Somebody put together a slide, they've done this actually for several of the biggest banks in the world. And what they did is they took a home page, so in the center of that slide is a home page of a bank. And then what they did is they mapped all the competitors, all the new little startups that are going, all the little ankle biters that are going after the business of that big bank. And every single bank is dealing with that. Every single bank has that kind of competition coming up and disrupting them, trying to go after the most valuable parts of their business. And you think about that from when it was, you know, 50 years ago, do you think bank executives worried about a list of competitors that look like that? They met in some back room somewhere over cigars and talked about how they were gonna divvy up the spoils of the market, right? It's a completely different world now. They have to respond to that, right? It's changed completely. Another example of change that often gets used is what's happening with Uber. And I know this example gets used over and over again because it's such a, an amazing example of disruption and change and transformation of an industry. But I think what people sometimes don't do is double click down into exactly how they're doing it. They just assume you know, they're taking the place of taxis. But they're doing it in a way that is really significant. They're doing it by not only transforming the industry, but at the same time, they're transforming themselves. And I love the story. So Uber, um, Uber had started with Uber Black Car, and then they moved to Uber X. And if you think about, if you're Uber, that's a pretty good thing. You get to sell a taxi ride, you know, trade, trade a taxi ride for an Uber ride. And if you think about Uber going to something like Uber Pool, which is their new carpool service, how many people have used Uber Pool out there? Pretty good, pretty good set of people. Okay, you, 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 go to the, you land at the airport and you say, I want to go to San Francisco, and you, you, know, you type in your destination and you get a, somebody else that rides along with you, and your fare is not quite half, but it's you know, 60, 70% of the fare. The, the driver makes more money, it's less expensive for the passengers, but if you're Uber, you know, that, that could have scared them. They're thinking, wow, we're going to reduce the number of rides. Turns out that Uber now does more carpool rides in San Francisco than they do one-person rides. And they just introduced that about a year ago. So unbelievable disruption just of themselves, their ability to use their digital platform to disrupt their own company and continue to evolve quickly is what's going to make them successful. All right, so let's talk about where that evolutionary change happens and doesn't work out so well. So Fortune 100. Fortune 100 in 1975, between 1975 and 2015, that list has about 75% of it has evaporated. It either, companies either went bankrupt or acquired. Some of them moved to lower on the Fortune 100 list. But the vast, only 25, 26 of those companies are left in the Fortune 100. And that's the kind of change we had since 1975. But here's what's really intriguing about it, and this goes to that asteroid-induced evolution that we're talking about. In 1975, it took 25 years for half of the Fortune 100 to disappear. In 1995, it took 12 years. That's the kind of pace of change that we're under. That's the rate at which disruption is happening to every single industry on the planet. And getting back to how we're gonna deal with that. So we've got, we've got customers that are changing, we've got technology that is changing, and we've got all this competitive disruption that's happening. And how do we respond to that? What is the normal response for most organizations and for most people? This is a perfectly reasonable response. Get back on that hamster wheel and run harder. We can run harder. We can run, be smarter. We can do this, guys. We just run a little bit harder and we can do it. Well, I'm sure that the dinosaurs, when that asteroid hit, ran like crazy. I'm sure they ran. Didn't help. Running harder, we can only run so hard. 10% harder, 20% harder. Maybe if we really go nuts, we run 50% harder. But that's not the kind of change that we're talking about. That's not the kind of speed that we're talking about. We're talking about changing the clock speed of your organization. And when I say clock speed, technical term for CPUs, the number of instructions that a computer can process per second. 
if you can increase the clock speed of a computer, if you can double its clock speed, it works twice as fast. And we're in a situation where we don't need to just double our clock speed. We need to make it 10x. We have to respond 10 times faster. You think those taxi cab companies that are dealing with Uber, they can't respond 50% faster. They have to respond 10 times faster to that change in their environment. We have to make that change. And then the question is, how do we do that? How does society, how do we as organizations change the clock speed of what we're doing? And fundamentally, one of the biggest changes to clock speed that society has ever seen is around a network. And I mean that in a very broad sense, not just a computer network. But the network, the concept of a network, the concept of every time you add a node to the network, it becoming more and more powerful. That, through the course of history, has been one of the fu most fundamental drivers of clock speed change to society. So the first network that drove the Industrial Revolution, the railroad network in the UK, if you read about the Industrial Revolution, the railroad network is cited as being the fundamental driver for the Industrial Revolution. The ability to move people, products, food, long distances where they never had that opportunity before. That transformed the world as we knew it. And it ushered in the Industrial Revolution. The next big part of the revolution happened with telephone and telegraph network. That network came online, and all of a sudden, we were able to communicate globally. That communications revolution is cited as being the next major uh, leg of the stool of the Industrial Revolution. So networks. Networks have been these things that have completely transformed the clock speed at which we go. And if you go f closer to today, and you just think about, think about your computer network, right? Everybody in this room, we just assume no matter where we go, we can plug in. You just plug in, whether it's wireless or wired, you just plug in automatically. So if you're an IT department at a company, somebody buys a new printer, plug it in. New data source, plug it in. New voicemail system, email system, plug it in. Internet, video, whatever you need. You just assume that that computer network is always there. It's always on, it's always available. We take it so much for granted, right? But it completely changes the clock speed at which we're able to operate. If we didn't have that computer network internally, we would not be able to operate the way we do today. And I would just encourage us to think for two seconds, because it's so easy to take this stuff for granted. You know, close your eyes for a second. Imagine, imagine you got a phone call from somebody in your organization, and they said, hey, we've got a problem with our network, folks. Um, it's going to be down for the next two years. Right? OK. So think about that phone call. I, I know it wouldn't happen. I know technically we'd be able to recover from that. But just imagine something bizarre happened. Your network, only your network, is going to be down for the next two years. OK. After that two-year period, after that asteroid hit, how many people would think that their organizations, their companies, would still be in business after two years? Nobody. OK. All right. So. That network, that computer network, is essential to everything we do now. We just take that thing for granted. It's just assumed that that network is there and it's on. OK, so how does this relate to everything we're talking about? We're going to talk today about the application network and how that is going to transform your business. The problem with what we have today with all the technology is that it is literally a pile of building blocks. And they're amazing, right? You have hundreds of millions, if not billions, of smart devices, cell phones, IoT, other things you can connect to. You have hundreds and thousands of SaaS applications that you can deploy. The technologies that are available to you today are better than they ever have been before by an order of magnitude over a few, just a few years ago. You have incredible access to technology, but it is this big pile of stuff. And the way most of us have been doing it and dealing with this year after year is we take that pile of Lego blocks and we actually don't stick them together. We actually pull out a bottle of crazy glue and we glue it all together, right? That's the way it's been done. You glue this together in this big monolithic thing that works and then you have to evolve. Then you have to change. Then another asteroid hits and now this thing is all glued together and it's locked down. 
But that's the way we've had to do it in the past. We've never been able to figure out a way to make all of this pluggable, to make all of this reusable. That hasn't been available to us. The change now is that we have APIs. That is the fundamental driver and change that I don't think the world has still quite yet woken up to. The API, now there's 15,000 public APIs. 2005, there were 100. There's 15,000 public APIs. One of our customers has built out 6,000 APIs internally. So there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of APIs, external and internal. The API is now enabling you to build this application network. It lets you build something that is composable, reusable, and completely pluggable. So what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of days is how to build out that application network. 